These landings were made close to Lamitan and Lemui, inland from San Rafael. Securing the hilly country in back of the beaches to forestall any Nazi retreat was the main job of the airborne troops. They were to help put pressure on the enemy defense shell from the inside. Some gliders, coming in fast, made spectacular landings. Shells and supplies were quickly unloaded and put to use. Within three and a half hours of landing, this crew had eight mortars in firing position. German ammo dumps were destroyed while patrols formed roadblocks and drove to key points. Meanwhile, more than 800 warships, greatest naval force ever assembled in the Mediterranean, was massed over 40 miles of sea to effect widely separated landings. An armada composed mainly of American, British, and French vessels. It included Canadian, Dutch, Polish, Greek, and Belgian ships. For three hours before the landing assault, big guns of this international navy thundered bombardment against shore defenses. Amplified by the Air Force bombs that were salvoed almost simultaneously, it was said to have been more effective gunfire than any previously laid down in the Mediterranean. Behind this curtain of fire, small craft awaited the signal to move in. As the time neared for the seaborne invasion to land, all available air power carried capacity loads of explosives to pour on all visible targets. Lightnings, thunderbolts, and Bostons struck at enemy armor and troop concentrations in the rear. Flying more than 1,000 sorties during the morning, Fighters and fighter bombers roamed the invasion area practically unopposed, attacking gun emplacements and transportation facilities. Fighters escorted troop carriers to their objectives provided cover for both troops and ships, and strapped motor transport and other targets of opportunity. Meantime, mediums and heavies, leaving the Navy to continue the job they started of clearing the beaches, swept inland. As each hour approached, beachhead bombing was restricted because overcast conditions constituted a hazard to Allied troops. Here, B-26s hit a road bridge at Arles on the Rhone River, northwest of Marseille. The second bridge nearby had been previously flattened. As the convoy prepared to move shoreward, the sea was calm, in contrast to previous Mediterranean operations. The magnitude of naval fire was maintained as strongly as the air support. At 730 hours, the landing craft started plugging toward the shore. Heavy covering by both Navy and Air Forces continued. The huge convoy was preceded close inshore by minesweepers. Officers studied maps as each hour was at hand. Three main landing beaches were in the San Tropez, San Rafael areas.
pontoons by which heavy equipment could gain the beaches were launched, and as ducks ferried light material to the beaches, the pontoons were jockeyed into position. Smoke from phosphorus shells etched the shore. It had been anticipated that the outer rim of coastline would be hard to crack. Preliminary reconnaissance indicated shore defenses were solid, although not too well supported from behind. A few days before, anti-aircraft batteries were so thick along the entire coastal sector that planes officially recorded flak as intense. But they had been silenced, and now landing craft unloaded their men and supplies with almost no resistance in the first stages. By 830 hours, patrols were striking across the Riviera countryside, across land that had once been a world-famous playground, to consolidate positions inland with the airborne troops. Successful beachheads had been established and a new front opened. By mid-morning, engineers were already bringing up equipment to construct an airfield. Mine detectors cleared a prospective site, digging out 45-kilogram German shells equipped with tripwire detonators. 25, like this one, were found in an area 30 yards square. Bulldozers leveled the vineyards and orchards of French farmers. But even as the heavy equipment overran their homes, the French civilians were cooperative, disclosing locations of mines. Work on the construction of the runway was pushed ahead while the fighting continued nearby. Within eight hours, marked progress had been made on a strip 150 feet wide by 3,000 feet long. Although resistance was met occasionally, there was no sign of concerted opposition. And except for a few casualties, some of them from parachute landings, it appeared as though the enemy had been caught entirely unprepared. Troops had little trouble making their way overland and soon met seaborne troops, closing lines that eventually interlaced the entire invasion area. French civilians mobilized to help them, solicitous of their smallest personal needs. By D-Day plus one, as equipment rolled into Lemuy, swift advance had expanded the beachhead 500 square miles. Casualties continued to be extremely light. Unloadings exceeded expectations. Seaborne and airborne troops had met everywhere ashore, and assault forces were complete with tank and tank destroyer units and a well-balanced stock of ammunition and supplies. The same day, bombers continued to strengthen Allied gains. Installations were bombed at Toulon, which, with Marseille, offered organized resistance. But by August 23rd, Marseille, France's second city, fell, and Toulon was encircled. Mitchells passed abandoned gliders on their way to block any northern avenues of reinforcement. And as the reborn French army fought victoriously on its own soil again, blasts, like those on a bridge at Livron, sounded liberation over all of France. <laughs> 